people on this panel. And then there was only me. But I'm glad to see that they've kept the setting for the second person. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. My name is Marty Merriman, and I'm Vice President of an organization that has a long name. It's called the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict. It's in Washington, D.C. And this is my first time in Istanbul. And I want to uh, thank uh, the Nonviolent Education and Research Center for inviting me to speak to you all. And again, I want to thank you all for coming. It's great to be here. So I will tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I guess my bio was translated, uh, but I'll just give you a few short things. Um, for the last 12 years, my work has focused on looking at human rights movements around the world. Movements that are struggling for women's rights, labor rights, anti-corruption struggles, struggles for the environment, struggles for democratic rights, struggles for indigenous and minority rights, and I look at struggles against governments, and I look at struggles against corporations. And I try to figure out what makes these movements effective. Why do some succeed and why do others fail? Why is it that in a certain place, for example, a protest may work at one time and not work at another time? Why is it that even in the same place, what works one year may not work a different year? And the organization that I'm proud to work for is the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict, and, and our organization is dedicated to trying to figure that out, and then providing education to people about it. Now, what we try to understand in particular is strategy. We are very interested in the choices that movements make. And so the presentation I want to give you all today is about that. Okay, so it has, how many parts does it have? Oh, it has six parts, good. So the first, I just want to define my terms. What is nonviolent action and what is a movement? Those are two terms that I'm going to use a lot, and I think if we under start with an understanding of those and we all know, okay, this is what we're talking about, then the rest of it will make sense. For the third part, I want to talk about examples of nonviolent movements, starting with nonviolent movements in my own country, the United States. Then, parts four, five, and six, I want to talk about how nonviolent action works. How is it? that ordinary people can nonviolently challenge human rights abusers who seem to have all the advantages, who have weapons, or who have lots of money, who seem so organized. How is it that ordinary people nonviolently challenge them and win? And when you look at the history, what you realize is that ordinary people nonviolently challenge them and win a lot, a lot more than most people think. This is one of the reasons why I like my job. Because when you go to a human rights presentation, you don't expect good news. But I am in the good news business. I get to give good news. There are things that are positive and give reason for optimism in the field of human rights right now. And a lot of it has to do with these nonviolent movements. I will, for the fifth point, talk about the record of nonviolent movements, historically what the research says, Little warning, I will get pretty academic in this part. Um, and then for the last part, I will talk about explaining the record. If they're more successful than most people think they are, why is that? Okay, part one. What is nonviolent action? What are we talking 
I'll give you two images. Well, actually, three images. Here's two. When do you think this was taken? 2003. It's on the slide. I forgot. This is a demonstration in Washington, D.C. against the Iraq War in 2003. The demonstration, the protest demonstration, is the most common image that the media shows us about the nonviolent actions. For some people, protest demonstration is all there is. That's what nonviolent action is. For me, it's much, much bigger than that. But this is the most common image. And we understand why the media takes it, because it shows numbers. It's exciting. It's interesting. It makes you want to read. Who are these people? Why are they doing this? Here's another, here's another image. This was taken in 1955 in the city of Montgomery in the state of Alabama in the United States. This is what the buses looked like after the activist Rosa Parks, who was black, refused to get on the bus when the law and the custom said that she should. She refused to give up her bus seat to a white person. She was kicked off and arrested. And this began the Montgomery bus boycott, which lasted for about one year. <coughs> This is an act of nonviolent action, but it doesn't lend itself to a photograph the same way the protest does. And so the definition I want to give you is a definition that can actually include both this and this under one definition. So I'm going to give you the definition that was developed by Gene Sharp. Anyone know who Gene Sharp is? Raise your hand. No? So Gene Sharp was a scholar, and in the 1970s, he, and 60s and even 50s, he studied movements all over the world and tried to figure out what is the common definition for what they're doing. And he came up with a definition pretty much like this. Nonviolent action is a way for people to wield power without using violence. It consists of three kinds of actions. The first kind are called acts of commission. This is where people do things that they're not supposed to do, that they're not expected to do, or that are illegal to do. Okay? So protesting when you're not supposed to protest is an act of commission. In some countries, even wearing a certain color or symbol could be an act of commission. In other countries, maybe not. So there is some element there of context to decide what an act of commission is. But it's doing something you're not supposed to do. Then there's acts of omission. This is where people refuse to do things that they're supposed to do. And you can get really creative with both of these. For example, I could choose not to pay my electrical bill, not to pay my taxes, take money out of banks. I could choose to not send my kids to school. I could choose not to buy a certain product. I can do all refuse to do all kinds of things that I'm supposed to do. I can refuse to celebrate holidays. I can refuse to show up for events. These are all acts of omission. And then the third is a combination of both. This would be, for example, if I pulled my children out of public school in the United States, and at the same time, I started an alternative school in my living room. I created an alternative school, an active commission, and I put my kids out. A public school, an active omission. Now, there are a few things that implications of this definition. The first is that the way Sharp is defining this, he's defining nonviolent action as something, by definition, that happens outside of institutions. For Sharp, voting is not nonviolent action. Having a lawsuit and using the courts is not nonviolent action. For Sharp, by definition, it's outside of that. But, in practice, many, many movements use both at the same time. They'll use elections, they'll use the courts, and they'll use nonviolent action. And there is a history of nonviolent action being the key thing that actually helps election systems and courts work the way they're supposed to after they've been corrupted. The second point is that it's adaptable and creative. So, my colleagues hear me say this a lot, but I have two children. They are very adaptable and creative at knowing how to not do things I want them to do and how to refuse to do things that I do want them to do. It resides deep in our psychology that we understand acts of omission and acts of commission. There are so many different ways we can choose to change our behavior and attitudes. And what nonviolent movements do is they do that collectively with lots of people in strategic and organized ways. 
And the third point is very important. For Sharpe's definition, which is also the definition I use, the underlying idea is that power comes from obedience and consent of people in society. And nonviolent action then is about taking that away in organized, strategic, and disciplined ways. And when that happens, ordinary people who don't have a special status or privilege or voice, they can make their voices heard, and they can actually really have power, and they can make change, according to this definition. Now, we'll get past definitions in one more minute, but this is an important one. What is a movement? So I define a movement as ongoing, so it's continual. It's not just one tactic, a big protest disappears. It's something that happens over time, continually, collective, lots of people, efforts aimed at bringing about consequential change, significant change in a social, economic, or political world. Movements are civilian-based, which means they're based in people, ordinary people, involve widespread popular participation, and they alert is the first thing they do. They get issues on the agenda. No one's talking about a certain political, economic, or social issue, and a movement puts that issue on the agenda. It forces people to talk about it. They also educate people. One of the ways that people gain political consciousness is they might get involved in a movement in their town or city because there's a certain issue that concerns them and as they start looking at that issue, they realize that that issue is a symbol of something much, much bigger. And it changes the political consciousness so that they see, in fact, I'm fighting for this one thing in my town or city, but it represents something much bigger. They serve. They serve. Some movements provide childcare. Some movements provide food for the poor. Some movements help teach classes. Some, they do lots of things. They serve a community. And not just material needs, emotional needs. They serve people's emotional needs. They, movements are communities in their own way. They have identities that people join and work together in. And then last, they mobilize people, which I don't need to tell you because you see it in the media all the time. But these other functions are very important. You can't get a picture of a movement you know, alerting people necessarily, but they do. <laughs> okay. So what are the characteristics here? One, movements are voluntary. This is one of the really important differences between a movement and an organization. Organization, they have money, they can hire you, they can fire you, they can promote you, they can demote you. The state, they can you know, put you on trial, or if you are, you know, refuse an order, they can get you into all kinds of trouble. Movements don't have that. Movements depend on people saying, I just want to be part of this, so I'm going to come. It's very different than typical organizations. Movements have organizations in them, and organizations can play a very important role, and organizations can form coalitions and movements, but the movement is bigger than just the organizations in it. And they really consist of people coming because they want to be there. To do that, movements have to represent people. People don't show up unless they feel like this movement really represents me. They speak in a language that I understand. They use words that make sense to me. They talk about change in a way that I think about change. I feel some kind of emotional connection to them. I feel welcome there. They're often diverse. They're often diverse. If a movement starts as just a group of students, if it wants to achieve change at its university, maybe it can do that. But if it wants to grow and become something even bigger, it will have to incorporate people from other professions, other ages, and so forth. Not an organization, we talked about that. Not a spontaneous outburst. Next time a big tactic happens and it's in the newspaper, if someone says, is that a movement? My answer is, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to last. Let's see how long it lasts. If it sustains itself over time, we can start calling it a movement. But my opinion is there's lots of things that get big, get little, that's it. So it's over time that we really start to see something's a movement. And as I was sort of saying before, nonviolent movements have been used to achieve all these purposes in rights and discrimination and in corruption and so forth. 
Um, and they happen all over the world. There's not a ge geography or culture that owns them or that created them. It did not come from God. It really is something, I think about my kids again, that's very basic in all of our psychology about we want to do what we want to do. We don't want to do what we don't want to do. That's why I think we find it everywhere. It's part of our shared humanity. So what are some examples? I like starting, I'll start with Gandhi. There's Gandhi. In 1931, marching against the British salt tax. I don't say more than that. But in my own country, a lot of the great things that have been achieved have been achieved through nonviolent struggle. So this is the women's suffrage movement. Uh, women in the United States didn't have the right to vote in our Constitution before 1920. And they struggled and struggled. They used the court system. But then that wasn't working, and so they escalated to nonviolent action. There was repression used against them. Over 200 were arrested in front of the White House. Some were thrown into jail or thrown into uh, mental asylums. And they kept pushing, and they had a strategy, and they were organized, and they were disciplined, and they got the right to vote. The U.S. labor movement in the 1930s, there are bumper stickers in the United States that say, the 40-hour work week, thank the, labor, thank the labor movement, or the people who brought you the 40-hour work week, the labor movement. A lot of the labor protections we have in the United States came out of this struggle in the 1930s, largely nonviolent. The civil rights movement, which everyone knows, which was a movement that went on, it depends which historian you talk to, but at the minimum you have to say 1955 to 1967. People forget that. When we hear about the civil rights movement, people think, oh, Martin Luther King, right, and it all happened. No, it's 12 years. Minimum 12 years to get those changes. I mean, he got some major changes in 64, but the movement, I would say, stretched for 12 years. And here are some different scenes from it. Yes, there's the Great March on Washington, famous image, and then there's also people getting beat up, as we know. Um, my understanding is, I believe about 130 people were killed during that movement. Here's Martin Luther King getting arrested, and here he is meeting with the president. And it's really interesting, if anyone ever doubts that nonviolent movements can get attention, here's Martin Luther King getting arrested, and here he is meeting with the president. It, people go from the streets to sometimes having a lot of power, very, very, it can happen quickly. And um, not that the only definition of power is meeting with the president, by the way. Here's another image. In the, in the 1960s, some of the most exploited workers in the United States worked on farms in the western part of the country. I won't give you a lot of statistics about how tough their life was, but I'll tell you one thing. The average farm worker lifespan in 1960s 1960s was 47 years. That's it. They were mostly Mexican American and Filipino American, and they decided. And well, they had been doing strikes for a long time and hadn't worked. And in 1965, they did a strike. This is Cesar Chavez. He's famous for leading them. This is Dolores Huerta. She also led them. Also famous. And <clears throat> the strike itself wasn't enough, so they escalated it to a boycott. And they chose a target. They were going to go after only one thing that was grown in California, grapes. They didn't want people to drink wine anymore from these non-union farms. And they didn't want people to buy grapes for their table. Now, interestingly, the, the grape farmers had powerful allies in the, in the White House. President Nixon actually started shipping grapes to Vietnam, to soldiers in Vietnam, to try to buy up all these extra grapes. The people who were striking were harassed, arrested, beaten. And when they escalated to a national boycott, they got consumers involved. These are just people with signs saying, don't buy grapes. Uh, they started to really win. Here is a picture of Ted Kennedy signing a pledge saying he wouldn't even buy grapes. They started to get major power. It wasn't because Ted Kennedy cared or because Robert Kennedy cared. It was because they were making it impossible for these great businesses to keep running because they were depriving them of money. They were forcing change. And here they are signing a contract, which I believe uh, in, in 1970, so in only five years, they unionized 85% of the great market. 
there's nonviolent action against the Vietnam War. Nonviolent action against nuclear power plants. There was a plan to build over a thousand nuclear power plants in the United States. That was going to be the U.S. energy policy. People said uh, that's not. We don't want that. And organized for a good decade and stopped it. AIDS activism. In, the, in 1990, these are people doing a quote dying, pretending to die in the middle of San Francisco to get their issue on the agenda. More recently, we have movements in the U.S. against what's called the Keystone Pipeline, a massive project to bring oil down from Canada to the south coast of the U.S. People are in front of the White House, occupying. I wouldn't, I'm not sure I'd call it a movement, it didn't last a long time, but it is, it, it, it set certain things into motion. And then we have other cases around the world, and I have too many slides to go into, but everything from case, this is people protesting in Bolivia in 2000 against the purchase of their water by U.S. corporations trying to privatize their water. This is an anti-corruption campaign in Korea. This is an anti-corruption campaign in Palermo, in Sicily, in Italy, against the Mafia. This says, against paying protection money to the Mafia, if you're against that, start buying differently. And what they did is they got businesses in Palermo to pledge, I'm not giving protection money to the Mafia anymore. And they got consumers to say, I will only shop at businesses that don't pay this protection money. There's another image from that campaign. That's their logo, and here it says, I pay the person who doesn't pay. I pay the business that doesn't pay. This here is women of Zimbabwe arrives. Uh, they have been active in Zimbabwe for at least 10 years. And this woman here is Jennifer Williams. She's one of the bravest people I've ever met. And their slogan, or their symbol, is the L, which in English is for love. And the way they talk about their movement, they are like mothers who are giving tough love to President Mugabe, who needs the tough love of a parent and a mother to say enough. This is the Iranian women's movement, an image from 2006, when women were banned from going to football matches, and they stormed a portion of the stadium uh, during a World Cup, a pre-World Cup match when there was all this international media. This is the lawyers' movement in Pakistan, when President Pervez Musharraf forced the Supreme Court Justice, the head justice of the Supreme Court, to resign. I like to think President Musharraf made one of the worst decisions he could have made. Who on earth wants to make every single lawyer in the country mad at them? The lawyers organized. Two years later, Musharraf gone, Supreme Court Justice back in the court. West Bank and Palestine. Has anyone seen a film called Budras? Has anyone heard of a film called Budras? It's a, it's a film that documents nonviolent action by Palestinians against the separation law. And they succeeded in this city, in this village of Budras, by actually getting the wall to move further from their land. In Russia, this is, these are demonstrators who are uh, trying to stop construction of, in a forest. Um, it's an environmental campaign, but also uh, started to expose corruption too. It's called the Himki, the Himki Forest. And here is one of the leaders uh, blocking a vehicle from leaving that. Her name is Evgenia Chirkova. Then of course, we have the Arab Spring, the Arab Awakening, Tunisia, Egypt, we have, in, in other countries, I'm not listing all of them, we have the Indignados movement in Spain. Recent events in Ukraine, some of which got violent, but the power of that movement, I would argue, was the nonviolent part. Even in, in, in Canada, last slide of movements, I promise, where these are people, I know one of the organizers of this campaign, that's trying to stop drilling for natural gas going on all over their province. And they have been so effective that they've completely stopped it completely nonviolent. And what they've done here is to make sure that it's stopped and it stays stopped, they have set up an emergency telephone number 
The emergency telephone number of North America is 911. You call that if you want to call the police. So here, the kind of rock that has this natural gas, in French they call it schiste. So the phone number is 1-888-SCHIST. So you can easily remember it. Their organization is called Schist 911. And basically, they have people all over their province, and if they see any mining truck or any drilling truck come in, they call that number and people immediately mobilize to try to stop it. Then there's Hong Kong. You get my point. Now, not all of these movements, of course, succeed. It's not all good news. But we're going to talk a little bit more about what the historical trends are that show you um, why there is room for, why there is some reason for optimism. So how do these movements work? It's very simple. It gets to that issue of power I was talking about. So the conventional view of power is that power starts from the top and goes down. This is the kind of power that I was taught in school, in my history classes. This is the kind of power that uh, rulers and whether they're from corporations or governments want us to think, oh, we have the power, you got to don't, you have to listen to us. This is the kind of power that entertainment media shows and journalism shows a lot. I mean, they follow the very important people at the top. They don't normally interview lots of people who don't have power. And so the views here is that, you know, there are elites at the top of this triangle and they make policies and that the people underneath you know, to follow the policies. The power structure doesn't change. Power comes from control of resources, information, and, and the capacity for violence. And it suits power holders quite well to make people think this because they have the resources and the money. So it kind of is beneficial to them if everyone thinks that that's, the, that's what's really going on. But there's a different view of power, and that is that power actually comes from the bottom up. If people don't go to school, if people don't go to work, if buses don't run, if trucks don't run, if miners don't dig, if bureaucrats don't stamp things and do papers, if police don't investigate, if you know, the people who repair the buildings don't repair the buildings. If the people who build the bridges don't build the bridges, you get the idea. Things stop. And the control of resources, the control of information, the control of the capacity for violence depends on everyone pretty much doing what they're supposed to do. And you might think, well, yeah, okay, that's a nice idea philosophically, Hardy, but really, like, how practical is it? Well, that's what movements are trying to do all over the world, and a, and a bunch of them are succeeding. Um, and so, in this view, power is fragile. Because people can shift their behavior and attitudes, and it shifts the balance of power in society, because it depends on their consent. And the way I view it with my colleagues is that it's a contest. Leaders can do certain things to ordinary people, and ordinary people can do certain things back by going on strike or boycotting or whatever else. And sometimes the best organized, the side of the best strategy can win. So what is the record? I'm gonna use some statistics from a book called Why Civil Resistance Works. A book which was the research for this book was supported by my organization, the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict, and it was written by two colleagues and friends of mine, Erica Channel with Maria Stefan. And this book attempted to do deep statistical research on these movements. And they looked at 323 nonviolent and violent movements that were fighting violence between 1900 and 2006. So again, over 300 movements over, taking place over 100 years, some were violent, some were not violent. And here's what they found. They looked at the success rate. So, this is the success rate that they found for nonviolent movements, 53%. 53% of the time, nonviolent movements had a, had a goal that they achieved. 
How do they know they achieved it? They said, this is our goal, and then they achieved it. And they were taking on the government. There are many other cases that aren't just trying to take on a big government. They didn't do research on these. So there are lots of other avenues for research. And a lot of the cases I showed you earlier are not about trying to take on a government in all of its forms. But I'm using this research because this is the best stuff we have right now. And it's, it's quite good. So 53% success rate for nonviolent, 26% for violent. Partial success, you can see the difference. And look at the failure rate. This is a slide showing the effectiveness of nonviolent action and violence between 1940 and 2006. Do you see the trend? In recent decades, nonviolent action has become not just twice as effective as violence, but much, much more effective than violence, three or four times. And this is a very interesting slide. They looked and they said, well, five years after a violent and nonviolent movement ends, what's the outcome? And here's what they found. For a successful nonviolent movement, it resulted in a democratic outcome in a democratic system 57% of the time. Violence, it was 6% of the time. So you've got for violent revolutions that even ended in authoritarian government, it resulted in a new authoritarian government over 90% of the time. Now this is really interesting, this side. They looked at failed movements, okay? Failed nonviolent movement. Five years after it fails, they still found a 35% chance of a democratic outcome. Whereas, I think it's like 4 or 5% that failed violent movement. Now why is that? I would argue that it's because nonviolent movements organize thousands or millions of people. They get people who don't normally participate in politics to participate in politics. And I'm not just talking about voting, I'm talking about mobilizing, I'm talking about doing the things that actually hold power holders accountable. Exercising their power as citizens. And that this tends to decentralize power in society. If a human rights abusing state is characterized by a concentration of power in the government and very little power among the public, violence doesn't correct that imbalance. But nonviolent action brings up the power of the public, reduces the power of the human rights abuser, and changes the entire balance of power, which means it sustains itself. Okay. I would point out one other thing, by the way. It's dangerous sometimes to look at only one study and say, oh, this, this says it all, because any research project can have errors. However, I do put a lot of trust in this one. I know who did the research, but also I can independently tell you that the American Political Science Association, which is an academic association, not known for being really interested in nonviolent action, gave this their Book of the Year award. If there was anyone who was going to poke holes in the research methods of this, it was probably going to be the American Political Science Association. They couldn't. They gave it the best Book of the Year award. And the findings here, it's like, I was trying to think, what's the analogy? It's like saying, you know what? There's a new law in physics we just never knew about. And actually it disproves something that everyone thought. Everyone thought violence was the most powerful thing and actually, oops, we were wrong all those years. Nonviolent action is now proven, at least in these contexts, to be more effective. So how do you explain this result? I'll go through a few more slides and then I'll stop. So the, the, the conventional wisdom, what most people would argue, is well, yeah, nonviolent movements succeed. They succeed, they succeed when the conditions are very favorable. They happen in countries where it's very easy to protest or mobilize, and there's not a lot of oppression, and people have a high education level, or they or there's a lot of internet. They come up with lots of reasons in the environment, conditions why these movements succeed. 
I've listed a few here, I won't read them all. All kinds. So, my colleagues, Erica Chenna with Maria Stefan, tested this hypothesis. They looked at whether nonviolent movements can emerge, can develop, and also win in authoritarian environments. And they find, quote, the vast majority of nonviolent campaigns have emerged in authoritarian regimes where even peaceful opposition against the government may have failed. So they can emerge, but can they win? Yep. Even when we control for the target regime type, nonviolent resistance remains significant in improving the odds of success. Therefore, whether the opponent is democratic or non-democratic seems to matter little with regard to the success of nonviolent campaigns. What? Huh? That goes against all kinds of views, right? But they didn't stop there. They looked at the power of the state. Can a nonviolent movement succeed in a really powerful state or, and or a really weak state? So they tried to measure a state's power. They looked at the total population of the state, the percentage of the population in cities, the production of iron and steel in that state, the state's energy consumption, the military in that state, the military expenses and the budget. And they said, okay, these things, when they're high, they show a lot of power. And what they find is that the power of a state doesn't determine, A, whether a campaign emerges as nonviolent or violent. The power of a state doesn't shift people to one form of struggle or another. And then they also find no relationship between the power of the state, the capabilities of the state, and the probability of success. Nonviolent resistance continues to be effective regardless of how powerful the opponent's state is. They looked at repression. Even though a high level of repression can be a formidable obstacle to success, repression does not itself determine the outcome of the campaign. What they find is that heavy repression against nonviolent movements reduces the chance of success by 35%. Not more than that. So, a lot of times in the media you'll see it claimed, well, if there's so much repression, people can never possibly win. This data, taken over 100 years, Looking at over 300 cases, it says actually that's not true. And maybe in Q&A we can get into why it's not true. And then people will argue, well, it's really about what the U.S. is backing and international support for different movements. And they look at that and they find that neither foreign state support or international sanctions seem to positively or negatively affect the outcomes of nonviolent campaigns. That doesn't mean that state support is important in some cases, but it means on average, it's not the thing that people say it is when they talk about, oh, this determines the outcome. It doesn't. So, one other study I'll share with you, and then we'll, I'll, 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 I'll do a quick conclusion, is there's another study that looks at these environmental factors in 2007. And it was, they looked at 64 transitions from authoritarian governments that were between 1975 and 2006. And they looked at the level of economic development of these countries, and they looked at different types of regimes, like a military regime, a single party regime. They looked at how concentrated the power was in the regime, where it was the movement facing a really concentrated power regime or a regime that spread its power all over its country, you know. And they also looked at ethnic uh, and, and, and religious uh, tension in the country. They call it fractionalization or polarization. Here's their findings. Among the major implications of this finding is that civic movements, nonviolent action movements, are as likely to succeed in less developed, economically poor countries as in developed affluent societies. They don't find that economic development has a relationship to success. Nor does regime type seem to have an important influence on the ability of civic movements to achieve broad support. The study did find a positive effect on movement development. If a regime concentrates a lot of its power in itself, movements are more likely to come and challenge it and win. And they looked at polarization among different groups in society. They don't find evidence that ethnic or religious polarization has a major impact on the possibilities for the emergence of a, of a movement. So I realize when I give this presentation, people are like, that's nice, but I don't really believe it, or how could that possibly be so? And I want to point to 
one other factor we haven't talked about that I think explains a lot. If conditions don't determine the outcome, something else does. And I would argue that it's skills. I would argue that it's skills and the strategies of movements. There are strategies that movements can use in all kinds of environments. With low GDP or high GDP. High repression, low repression. Lots of different environments where they can adapt and make good strategic choices and still win. So the, all these conditions in the environment, the movement has no control over, right? But a strategy they have total control over. And so let's look at some strategic choices they can make. A movement gets to decide what its vision is and whether that vision unifies people or divides people. It's a movement's choice. It's incredibly important. And they also get to decide what their strategy is going to be. Some strategies are effective, some aren't. They, I'm just, I'll skip around here. They get to select what tactics they want to do. A strike, a boycott, something else. Stay at home, not even working, not going to school, not paying taxes. They get to choose. And they get to sequence those, five, six, seven, or eight, as part of what we call a campaign that builds up pressure. They get to choose what their objectives are. In the U.S. Civil Rights Movement, it was a strategic choice to go after the buses. They chose a city where 70% of the money for buses came from African Americans, which meant that the buses were a perfect boycott target. If they chose a city where 20% of the money came from African Americans, it would have been a terrible boycott, or not a, not a good boycott target. Movements get to decide. We see where a weakness is, and we're going to concentrate our strength on that. Um, creating effective communications, building coalitions, training people. A lot of movements, some movements invest very heavily in training. Remaining nonviolent, even when they're provoked. Providing no justification for violence to be used against the movement because they're extremely nonviolent. And you know, and on and on and on. There are so many different things the movement actually can't control. And so I think I'm going to stop there uh, and just, because I've talked long enough, open it up for some discussion. Thank you.